Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining today's webinar on how entertainment brands win at Native. Today, you're going to hear from what's going on behind the scenes. So today, it's going to be myself, who works at Nudge, from based in Florida, and then also Lauren from Variety, who's based in LA. So first up, just a bit of an introduction. Uh, my name's Holly Blue Arum. I'm the VP of Accounts at Nudge. Now, throughout my career, I've worked for a range of publishers, networks, and then also agency side. So I've had a really good uh, view of how native content works across all of those different partners. So either selling it at publishers like Vice, or you know, running those native campaigns at an agency uh, where we worked um, on uh, award-winning native campaigns. And now I specialize in native at Nudge, where I look after sales and account success. Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Kistner and I'm the brand marketing manager for Variety. So I joined Variety about two years ago and I've helped establish the Variety Content Studio. Um, we started about a year ago. Um, before Variety, I worked with Amazon Prime Video on their marketing for their original series. Um, and here at Variety, the way I work with the Variety Content Studio is I oversee the content creative proposals, the distribution plans. I also work on the execution of those plans and then the reporting. Awesome. So guys, today what we're going to go through is we're going to do a little bit of a level setter up front and just talk through what is native content just so that we're, we're all really clear about what we're talking about uh, during uh, the webinar. And then we're also going to talk about setting KPIs so that you guys can get these ramp campaigns right from the start. We're going to look at some of the best content formats for entertainment brands. We're going to look at some watch outs there as well. And then we're also going to look at how to select the right distribution platforms, making sure that you distribute effectively. And then we're going to settle the misnomer that you can't optimize after go live. We're going to dig into how you can optimize on the fly. But first up, let's all make sure we're clear on what native content is and what we're talking about, because we're going to refer to it a lot during the webinar. So, Content is the new advertising, but when content turns into advertising, it's held to a higher yardstick. It can't be planned, bought, transacted, or optimized the same way banners were, and that's why we're here today. And to be clear what we're referencing, I'm going to go through a few examples. So first up, what we have is um, a great piece from uh, Full Variety, uh, for Manchester by the Sea, with Amazon Studios, and this was a really rich piece. It featured clips, interviews, and images, really detailing the process behind creating the film. Another good example is a campaign that we managed, uh, measured, sorry, for uh, Xbox, the Halo Wars 2. And that was an article that appeared um, across the Vox network, and this is an example from the SB Nation version. It was really looking at combining the, the excitement of Halo Wars 2 with the sport-focused nature of the, uh, the SB Nation audience, and it featured videos and articles. And then another really great example, and actually one of my favorites, is um, another piece that was on Variety. And this was for the film Loving. Um, this was a really you know, beautiful piece of, con well, campaign really. It included multiple pieces of content, some that used um, original articles from uh, back when, when the case originally happened, talked about the movie, lots of really rich content for, uh, for the consumer to enjoy. And so, as you can imagine, um, if you think about these kinds of campaigns, it's really introduced a lot of complexity. And so, we want to kind of help settle some of that for you. We'll aim for all, but we'll settle at some of that. And uh, what we're going to start with is KPIs, because realistically, that is where you should be starting. So, these are an essential part of your campaign. Now, I think most people would think that's really obvious, but still, even now, in 2017, I can't tell you the amount of campaigns that we're seeing that there's not been clear KPIs set up front. It's really hard for everybody on the, you know, every, every player then to really do their job right. A, it's hard for the agency to actually prove the ROI back to the advertiser. It's hard for the advertiser to actually know that it worked. It's hard for the partner if they weren't sure to what they were supposed to be aiming for exactly, if they performed well and, you know, what they can do next. So it's really essential that you start off here. And there's a couple of ways that we think about this. First up, campaign objective. Again, I know it seems really obvious, but we really need to take a think about what we're looking to do with the campaign. And yes, I know that awareness <laughs> is likely to be a goal. I know every campaign, one of the objectives is brand awareness or you know, awareness of the movie, film, whatever it may be. 
But it's really essential that we dig deeper into these objectives. Reach cannot be the only objective when creating content. It's essential that you really look beyond that metric, otherwise you may find that yes, you got reach, but with the highest spend associated, if you were just looking for reach, you probably could have done a banner campaign. You need to really think about what some of the quality metrics are. So you need to think about what the objective is. Is it brand awareness? Is it dri driving people through to a site? Is it getting people to talk about it? Is it you know, getting people to you know, change their perception? All of those have really different quality metrics so that you can prove the ROI of the campaign. Yeah, Holly, jumping in here. Um, I, in entertainment, we noticed two um, main endemic goals in these campaigns. Um, one being nomination, so if it's a film or a TV show, being nominated for awards, and the other one would be tuning in, so that's a little more consumer focused. So we really see um, two type of object objectives in reaching a voter audience or consumer audience. So we really do work backwards from those goals to then set the KPIs. Definitely. Now, so you, you figured out what those goals are, like you said, maybe it's getting someone to watch a show, maybe it's getting someone to vote for something, but you need to kind of then back that into the right metrics. So what are the right metrics for you? Well, depending on objective, that's going to make some changes. So let's say, for example, I wanted to look about brand awareness and maybe sort of education, you know, like maybe let's think about loving. That was a really, um, you know, it's based on a, something that was based on a real life situation um, and there was a lot of information about it. I might want to look at reach, obviously, as part of my goal, but also I want to look at attention, maybe, as the quality metric. I want people to read those articles, you know, I want people to understand more about the real people that this happened to. So I'm going to use that attention and maybe possibly scroll as a quality metric to really prove the campaign. Now, if it included video and for entertainment, it should probably include video somewhere within the campaign. We're going to look at things like video plays, percentage watched, you know, those are going to be some of our quality metrics. If you were looking at things like, I want to drive someone to the site, you know, um, you're going to look at things like conversion rates. It's really essential that you look at like what the objectives are and then back those into the right metrics. Yeah, actually, I think um, personally, I've seen a shift um, in what our clients look for. Um, on custom campaigns. Um, at Variety, we originally were programmed to think that um, impressions are really the goals and how do we reach those impression numbers. But um, having worked on a lot of native campaigns here, we really have seen that clients are looking for views and engagement rates. So it does take kind of a shift um, in looking at these campaigns and what actually the clients are looking to measure. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's I think it's a really exciting shift, right? Because I think if you you know you think about content, you know, and I think you're so right, Lauren, with what you were saying, you know, impressions, right? That's we've all kind of come from from like the old digital media, if you will. So we know the the impressions and the click through rates, and that's kind of the language that we spoke. But with content, it does so much more, you know, and it's so much more, um, you know, it resonates so much more with audiences that you need these metrics, these quality metrics to really prove the success. So I think it's really exciting that we're moving into that range. <coughs> now, part of that is actually, they are new metrics, right? And so what are the benchmarks? So this is actually something we really found at Nudge, you know, so Nudge went out, we, we built these dashboards and these great metrics for people to measure their content campaigns and we looked at things like engagement and scroll and attention and all these lovely metrics. And then we'd go back, you know, to our clients and say, look, this is what you've got. And they would go, is that good though? Is it bad? Like those are just numbers. <laughs> and so because it's new, there's that, you know, not being sure if the campaign's really, you know, doing as it should do. So one of the things we did at Nudge is we built benchmarks, which calls averages across all Nudge measured campaigns. So across the hundreds of campaigns we measure every month, we then split it out by category. And so, what I can talk through is some entertainment benchmarks. So, I'll take you through a few of these. And this is across um, the last two quarters, and it's looking at um, a couple of different metrics. So, first up, attention minutes. Now, just to note, attention minutes are a little bit different to time on page. Time on page only looks at users who click through to a second page on the website. With attention minutes, we look at the time people are actively consuming the content you might find that you only have a campaign with one piece of content. So you really want to understand exactly the amount of attention that's been spent there. Now with entertainment campaigns, we find it's around 0 0.9. Just to give you a bit more insight into that, across all nudge measured campaigns, across all sponsored content, it's around 0 0.8. So it's coming in a little bit higher for entertainment. 
If we look at how far down people are scrolling through um, entertainment campaigns, it's around 54%. That's just a little bit lower than some other campaigns and other categories, but again, that's a really good insight for you if you're wanting to understand if your percentage scrolled is good compared to that. And then we look at engagement as a social score. So let's say that we were kind of going back to those brand objectives. Maybe I was looking to get people, you know, get some hype about a new movie that was coming out. I want people to be talking about it. Social engagement might be a really good metric for me to lean on. And with entertainment, we find that's around, you know, just over 7% of people that read the content take social action. But a really good thing to look at as well is to dive deeper than shares. And the reason I say dive deeper than shares is that shares are just increasing. I think Mark Zuckerberg likes to say it every year. There's more shares than ever on Facebook. And he's not wrong, but less and less people are clicking on those shares and coming back to the content that's been paid for that features on the partner's site. So it's really essential that you know the value in your social engagement. So we look at something called earned impressions. And earned impressions are any impressions that came through from an organic social share. So we're just showing you the value of that social share. And that percentage that we're looking at there, that's looking at the percentage of the campaign reach that came from those shares. And so we can see that within entertainment, that should actually make up 11% of your campaign reach. That's not being paid for reach. That's just people sharing it and their friends coming back and reading it. So it's a really great way of looking at the, um, the quality. And then the last metric that's not on there, but it's if you're looking to actually drive people to a conversion point. So a really good example would be, let's say that Netflix comes out with a new show, they create a piece of content, uh, they want to understand if people are um, you know, reading the content, but they also want to know when the show comes out in 10 days time, did any of those people go and watch that show? And so you can actually measure up to 60 days after someone read a piece of content, did they actually convert? And within entertainment, we find that that sits around 2 to 3% of people who read the content will take that conversion point. So <laughs> you've got all of that information. You've got what are my objectives, you know, you figuring out exactly what you want to do with the campaign. You figured out what the right metrics you need are. You've also got the benchmarks for those metrics, so you know what you should be aiming for. So now it's time to actually, you know, figure out what your uh, what your KPIs are. So let's talk about a couple of examples. If I was looking for that Netflix example, well, I might look for maybe attention and social engagement during, you know, when the content first comes out. That's one of my quality metrics. I want to know are people sharing it? Are they talking about the new show? Are they spending some attention reading the content? That's really going to educate them. But then I want to know in 60 days, are they going to actually go and, um, you know, watch the, within 60 days, did they watch the show? Okay, great. Well, I know then that I need to have a look at higher than 0.9 attention minutes. I want to get above a 7% social engagement. would like that earned impression to be around 11%. And I want to see if I can beat that 3% conversion rate. So really easily, you can sit at the beginning of the campaign, I'm knowing what I want it to do and the exact numbers I want. Yeah, and I think it is interesting, Holly, to note in entertainment with the two different type of campaigns, um, if you're running a voter campaign and you're looking to get nominations for a film or television show, you're really looking for that audience to be engaged in the content and really to interact with it and know it so that they would vote for it. Um, and then with a consumer campaign, you might be looking for views or shares or even just conversion rates into watching the show. So it really does depend on what kind of campaign the client is looking for um, in order to form those KPIs and pick the most important ones. Cool. Yeah, I think that, like, exactly like you said, Lauren. So it's about making sure that you're always working your way down there, right? So you're starting with what exactly those objectives are and then moving down and not sort of just starting to kind of, you know, get a bit excited and start picking up benchmarks and KPIs where you haven't even figured out what those objectives are. So just take the time and work through those steps and that can really help you get to those solid KPIs. Now, content formats, obviously pretty essential. Um, and I think it's really essential that you you look at what you're trying to do with the campaign and what the objectives are before you figure out the content formats. I know sometimes we are all hemmed in by what's available maybe, but it's a good thing to look out for. And so something that I would just note here is a couple of formats that are really good based on your KPIs. So we talked about conversion rates. Based on nudge data, we can tell you that articles with videos combined, so articles with a video throughout the content piece, are more likely to drive higher conversions than any other content format. So nice to know if you're looking to do that. Some other things are articles are going to drive higher attention. It 
does tend to. Even higher than if you just have a video. So even if you're just going to do a video, I would really, you know, strongly suggest, you know, depending, if you're just going to do a video, you're going to push it out via social, then that's great. If you're going to do a video and it's going to be on a partner's site, putting some content within there is going to get people to spend longer on the page um, and get them more likely to kind of take that post-purchase intent. And then a little bit of um, another one is I know it's a super obvious one and it's been obvious for the last few years, but a good one to remember is lists still drive the highest social engagement. So really depending on what you're looking for, might not be right for every campaign, but don't forget about lists. They can really work with social engagement. Yeah, Holly, um, for Variety personally, we um, experience um, a big decision when it comes to choosing the right format. Um, with having Variety.com, Variety, our weekly print issue, our social media, it's really important um, to make sure we are choosing the right format and placing it on the correct platform. Um, and so the different formats that we um, experience is we can do a custom article we can dig into our archives, like the example we had with Loving, and really pull out um, some content um, that was relevant from the time period. Um, we can do videos, and we can do photo galleries. There's so many options, and I think really looking at the KPI is important. So if a client is looking for views, um, their main focus is they want as many views on that content as possible. Maybe we wouldn't create a hub. Maybe we wouldn't make it harder for the viewer to actually um, watch that video. So we would maybe do a social strategy instead um, and push the videos out on that. So I think it is important to look at what the KPI is and then work backwards and choose that format. Definitely. I really like that example of that. Like maybe it's if it was just views like on a video for example well then maybe you just want to push that video out via social you know like really being that kind of flexibility depending on what those KPIs are so really good to, to stick with that and then just a couple of watch outs we've talked about video and of, of course we can't talk about the entertainment category without talking about video <laughs> and it just wouldn't work but I just want to do a bit of a watch out here and this is something that we've seen happen quite a few times on campaigns so you're probably going to have video as an element in the campaign. Maybe it's going to be on social. Maybe it's going to be somewhere else. But one of the things that we've seen not work very well is where you're driving people through to a content like on a publisher site, and there's a video, like when they when they click through, let's say, from a social post, there's a video that's also playing. It's like taking up the whole screen. When that happens, I think the average is around 65 to 70% of people are likely to leave the page immediately. So just, just think about that. <laughs> you know, so we're 70% of people who came through to land on that content to watch the video are going to leave immediately. And I think if you look at why that is, you know, video sometimes just takes a bit more of a buy-in from people. And so let's say I've just clicked on a Facebook post, you know, someone shared something and it's, it's got a headline and an image, a bit of about copy. I didn't know that I was going to watch the video and I don't really know a huge amount about what the video is. Now immediately, if you put a headline above that video, and maybe a couple of lines of text, people are more likely to stay on the page. It's just with videos, they can sometimes be more of a buy-in. And so it's really good just to make sure people understand what's about to happen. And then you'll see those people staying on the page a little bit longer. Now, another one, Lauren talked about it a little bit, but um, is content hubs. Now, some content hubs, we've definitely seen people getting better at them. And But some content hubs we've seen in the past, they're really over-stylized. And this is watch out for, for agencies and brands as well in that, Sometimes, you know, the publisher really wants to help the brands and agency so much that the, the hub ends up looking more like the brand site than the partner site than the publisher site. And remember, the people that are coming through to the content probably already know what the site looks like. So they're used to discovering content that way. So it's really important that you make sure that the hub is designed it's designed to be friendly to the user, to people that read the site all the time, um, but also just not to be completely... Um, not, not, sorry, not to be completely, but just not to be so hard to navigate. We've seen some hubs where it's just been so hard for people to understand where they should be going or maybe there's interactive things and they, they don't know because it's so different. And so that can, it can just add a barrier to people to get to the content you want them to, uh, to read or watch. Yeah, definitely, Holly. We actually experienced that um, in the past. Our original hubs were more of a scroll-focused hub. So really they had to scroll through to view all the content. There were no tabs. Um, it was less interactive, and we saw some drop-off rates on that. Um, and so what we've done now, and as you could see in those examples earlier, is we make it a lot more interactive. We have 
apps, we have click-throughs, um, there's more video, easy to play, some article. It's really more of an experience rather than just a scroll through and see all the content. Um, they kind of get a little more lost in the hub than if they would um, scrolling through just a one-pager. Yeah, I mean, and I have to agree, I think, um, for example, I mentioned before I was a fan of the Loving <laughs> piece just because I thought that was so great, pulling in those, you know, articles and stuff from, from the original time. But actually, when you get through to it, I actually didn't almost realize it was a hub, if you know what I mean, because there was immediately content there for me to consume, and it was really easy to navigate. And so hubs are okay if they're done in the right way, and if they're not going to be a barrier to someone reading the content, because... Why would you want to put that barrier up? So I think it's really great, especially from you know, what Lauren was saying and has talked about with me before, is that they'd seen that something wasn't working and they've shifted it to, to include that so that people can actually consume that content you know, really easily. So definitely something that can be done, but just make sure, that, um, make sure that it fits in with what the publisher does, make sure it's easy to navigate, make sure that readers of the publisher's site aren't going to be thrown like, what is this? <laughs> um, just make sure that it really fits there and you're going to find A, it's much more seamless and B, people aren't going to leave the page as quickly. You're going to get more people engaging and interacting with the content. So definitely, definitely a good thing to keep an eye on. Now, distribution. Ah, distribution. <laughs> it's <laughs> going to be a huge part of your content campaign. You know, as much as I think Lauren and I were laughing about this a while before, but, um, you know, as much as I'd love to say, you know, these beautiful pieces of content that get created and as much as I'd love to say that we just put these beautiful pieces of content out and magically people arrive and read and engage and do all the things we want them to do um, that's not really the way it works unfortunately you know everything needs distribution and that might distribution might just be across the publisher's site via you know native units or via their homepage it might be via their social platforms maybe the agency or advertiser is actually driving some traffic there as well we see a lot of times like that where it's mixed between the both um, but however that happens, it's going to happen and it's going to be a big part of the campaign and it's essential you approach it the right way. Now, the following steps are a bit of a mix of varieties um, approach and then like the, the nudge uh, recommendation as well. So I will let uh, Lauren kick it off. Yeah, definitely. Um, so first of all, when we're working with a client, we want to make sure that we are using a preferred content medium. Um, so maybe they'll already have some video for footage that we could work in, or some text that they would like worked into an article. It really is looking at what the client already has um, and how we could work it into our own content. Um, next, we look at the target audience. So we really look, are they trying to reach a voter audience? Um, maybe they, that would skew older. Those, that audience would read our variety print um, or variety.com. Maybe they would spend less time on social media. Um, so we do look at that target audience to really select those distribution platforms. Um, we also look at the performance goals. So as I mentioned earlier, if they are looking for video views, maybe social is the best way to go about it. Maybe it's um, putting video on variety.com and driving traffic to those videos. Um, it really depends on what the goals are of the campaign. Do they want something tangible that they can take back um, for example, the Loving Campaign, we created a print um, section in our weekly edition that was a tangible object that actually some of the stars from the film loved to have themselves and took 10 copies home. So it really is, you have to look at those goals first um, before you select those distribution platforms. Yeah, I think I, the way I really liked that what you talked about the other one was actually that distribution with the way you guys talk about it, it doesn't feel like the add-on at the end of the campaign and I think that's so essential because I think that's sometimes what happens is that people sort of think, okay, we create the content, we do all of this and then we after we think about distribution but you kind of need to think about it more cohesively than that at the beginning of the campaign. You need to think about your content, what's the audience, what the goals are, that's going to actually give you all of that distribution insight and then once you've got all of that, You've really got to focus on post-click metrics. And what I mean by post-click metrics is, again, going back to that kind of old way we used to speak about things, the, you know, the CPMs and the click-through rates and the CPCs and all of those, those words. Of course, those things still are important in terms of distribution. We all need to know what we're paying, you know, what we're paying for um, traffic. But it's really essential that when you start using content, you look at post-click metrics. Um, and over at Nudge, we're, we're obsessed with post-click metrics. <laughs> so it's about looking at what people do once they get on the content. 
Now, when you're looking at your distribution, it's essential that you look at those post-click metrics so that you can really understand what's working and what's not working. You know, you need to understand, okay, all these people are coming through from all these different sources. You know, are they consuming it? Are they leaving it before the page loads? Are they sharing the content? You know, are they then going and taking a conversion point on the brand site? You know, those are the metrics that are going to actually allow you to figure out what's working in terms of distribution and make data-informed decisions off of that. And that really brings us into Optimize. So once it comes to, um, you know, you've got the distribution campaign running, you've got your content live, you know, you've got this, these beautiful pieces of content you may be driving through a hub, maybe, you know, one or two pieces. You need to make data-informed decisions about the distribution and optimize based off that. You know, it's such a huge part of the campaign. Um, and I, a good example of this was that we were actually measuring a, a movie a campaign that had launched and, and the reach was going as expected you know they were happy with their reach um, you know they knew they were going to hit their goal by the end of the campaign but the attention and social engagement were very much under par like they were not getting up to those benchmarks they had set I think they were looking at around 3% social engagement if you remember the benchmark was over 7 and that those shares weren't really bringing as many people back to the content as they would have liked so what could they do? Well, in this case, what they're able to do is actually look at how people are arriving at the content and what their, those post-click metrics, and what they're able to look at, the agency and the publisher together, was that they could see that out of the five different native units, three of them that were running across the sites and maybe the, some of their network just weren't performing that well, and they were driving quite low attention and a bit of a higher bounce. And they could also see that out of the two social posts they'd done, that the one they'd done a few days before was just performing incredibly well. People that came through from that promoted Facebook post were spending, I think it was like 1.5 attention minutes on the content, so way over the benchmark of 0.9, and people from that source were sharing the content. Okay, great. That allowed them to then put the distribution, put some more distribution budget behind that social post to get that out you know, to the right people. And, and what they saw then was the engagement and the attention increased. They also found out of those four different native units, one was performing actually really well, so they just performed, moved some budget across to that. And with all of that, what they were able to do was get to the end of the campaign, hit their reach targets, but also make sure that they hit all of their quality targets as well. So they came in, I think at the end it was around 1.02 attention minutes, or higher than the average, and I think they ended up at, at around an 8% engagement, so just above the social engagement. But they just did that through the optimization of the distribution. They did not change any content. They did not change headlines. They just look, you know, the headline on the content, they just changed where they focus their distribution budget. So um, definitely a huge part of it. And uh, I'll let Lauren talk more about loving. Sure. So I would like to walk everyone through this case study because I think it is a great um, example of selecting the right distribution platforms. Um, so with this loving campaign, to give you a little background, we were working with Focus Features and this was for award season. So they were looking for nominations for this film. Um, and so what we did um, was look at their target audience, which was the awards voters. Um, their preferred content medium was articles. Um, and then their performance goals were nominations and awards. Um, and so a interesting way we decided to make text seem a little more fun um, was to dig into our archives and actually analyze the daily conflict um, of marriage equality in the 1950s. Um, and we had old clips of our magazine in these archives that we kind of worked into the piece. Um, and so with that content, then we selected our distribution platform. So we included, as you can see on the slide, we included a section in print um, for the um, custom article. We promoted it on Variety um, through the custom hub that we designed. Um, we also pushed some of this content out on social. And as I barely touched on earlier, um, we actually distributed um, the issue that this feature was in at our 10 Directors to Watch um, event in Palm Springs. And in attendance was Ruth Nega and a few other uh, stars and crew of the film. And they really just loved having a tangible object I think they took like 10 to 15 copies for themselves of this story. Um, and so it really, I think this was a great example of something that um, included multiple platforms um, in one campaign. 
Yeah, I think I, mean, I think the great thing is that you're going to have some of those kind of campaigns, aren't you, where they're going to be things that you can do all of this stuff for. Now, of course, not every campaign is going to be the same. Not, not all the budgets are equal, right? <laughs> so some campaigns, it might be small things. It might just be moving budget against a different social post. For some, it might be just really looking at all of these different options. But just take the time, think about the content, what's available, think about the audience you're trying to reach, what those goals are. Make sure to keep an eye on those post-click metrics, and then based off all of that, make data-informed decisions to optimize the campaign. Which leads us very nicely <laughs> into optimizing on the fly. So too often, and definitely too often in native content, people operate under this assumption that once a campaign is live, you know, that's it. It's done. <laughs> like, it's launched, goodbye. Um, and that is really not the case when it comes to the content. You know, I'm going to talk through um, a few sections now when uh, you can see that what you have some, some really great examples and some great steps to kind of optimize on the fly. And then after that, Lauren's got a really great example for um, the Amazon campaign where they basically did all of these steps <laughs> in one. So first up is quality distribution. Now, obviously, I know we've just discussed it, but it's a bit of a recap is that this is where most of the optimization is going to happen during your campaign. You know, it's... It's an easy thing to change. You know, you can set these campaigns up, you can get your, um, you know, get the distribution started, and you can move budget. And the great thing as well is native ads can be created on the fly. You know, so you can really move things here. And I have to say at Nudge, we have seen so many campaigns where small distribution edits have made the difference to, you know, hitting those, um, hitting those KPIs and actually proving the success. And so, I think if you're an agency or brand here, it's essential that when you work with partners, publishers, that you um, make sure that they're flexible with the distribution, as a lot of the times, unfortunately, until a campaign is launched, you're not going to know what's working best. Now, even for publishers in this case, obviously, you've got a bit more information here. You, you guys run distribution across a lot of campaigns, but you know, not all content is created equally. And uh, what you might find here is that you also don't want to back yourselves into a corner. You don't want to say, hey, we're going to just do via this unit, we're going to do this many impressions, via that, we're going to do this. It's more of a, hey, look, here's all the impressions we're going to do, here's the budget that's going to go into distribution, and here's the option of partners that we're going to, you know, distribution things that we're going to look at, but we're going to move the budget based off the what's performing. And for most of the time, for most agencies we work with, I think they really respect that as well, because they're, you know, you're saying we're going to make the best decisions uh, for the campaign based off what works. And another part of that is devices. You know, I, I would love to say that every single piece of content is going to perform equally well on every device, but unfortunately for a lot of the time that doesn't actually happen. So, you know, when it comes to uh, devices, you really need to understand how the content's performing across each of those. So a good example of that is we were working on a campaign recently where exactly what we were talking about before, where they had that autoplay video on the background on desktop, and it was causing really high load times. So people were just like leaving the page. You, you know what we're all like now these days. If something doesn't load in a few seconds, we're probably out of there, right? Um, probably even less than a few seconds. <laughs> and uh, what they did is that because they knew that the video would cause even worse load times on mobile, the partner had said, look, we're not, we're not going to do an autoplay video on mobile. We're just going to make people hit the play button. We'll go from there. But what they could find out, which was that on mobile, people were spending like double the amount of attention on the you know on the um, on the page because the load time wasn't really slow they could actually connect with the video they could play um, and then they'd actually watch it but because of the desktop so many people were leaving the page so immediately what they thought was great let's just target let's move our distribution budget to mobile and we'll just see if that if that data really backs that up and they found that as they drove more traffic to mobile attention on mobile was just increasing um, and they could see that, yeah, that made the difference. And from there, they then made the content edit to desktop where they made it. You had to interact with the video before it played. And then overall, their attention um, increased dramatically um, across desktop, and they were able to end on a real high with that campaign. So it's really important that you look at how people are consuming the content on different devices. Don't just look at it, okay, across the whole campaign, this is what we're getting. Click through within your dashboard, whichever dashboard, hopefully not, <laughs> but click through and understand are people consuming it on desktop the same as they're consuming it on mobile? Okay, if they are, fine. But if they're not, you need to know that because then there can be optimizations to be made based off that information. 
Yeah, we have a bit of a, we call multiple pieces of content in a campaign. We call it like the insurance for your campaign. And the reason we call it that is kind of going back to what we were saying before is, but I would just love to say that every single piece of content in your campaign is going to be the best, bestest ever. But um, unfortunately, it's not always going to happen. You know, certain pieces are just going to resonate more with the audience. You know, it's depending on, it's depending on so many different things, but you're just going to find some pieces of content are just going to sort of, you know, hit the spot a little bit more. And so having multiple pieces allows you to move budget accordingly. So a good example of that, there was an entertainment um, campaign we were measuring recently where there were four pieces of content um, and it was across two different sites. Now the client was measuring uh, behavioral metrics and attribution. So they wanted to understand, okay, were people spending high attention on the content? Were they interacting with it? And also were they then um, within 60 days coming through to the brand site and downloading something? Now, with that information within the dashboard, what they were able to find out was that two pieces of content were driving double the attention of the other two, and they were accounting for almost 90% of all downloads back to the brand site. Okay, well, great. That means that they know these two pieces are, re are resonating the best. Let's move our distribution budget behind that. The agency and publisher came together on that, and they were able to really effectively figure out the plan. They put the budget behind it those two pieces, they found the engagement increased, the, um, the attention, they got more downloads, but also at the end of the campaign, they can really look at it and go, well, what was it about this content that resonated more? Because then they can always expand on that for their next campaign as well. And that's really great data for both agency and publisher. It means that everyone's got more information about it so they can make better campaign decisions. Now, content edits. There's a couple of things that can come under content edits. Now, the reason I normally say this should be the last thing is depending on the kind of edits, this could be where you're all of a sudden into that nightmare rat race where you've got to sign things off from clients, agencies, partners, Fred, John, anyone else that might need to sign it off. And that can really hold things up. So when I say those content edits, that's more about changing the copy in the, you know, in the article. It's more about changing videos and things like that. There are small content edits which can be done relatively pain-free. And by that, I mean things like share copy. Share copy can be a thing that can massively change a campaign. You know, we talked about those earned impressions before, about the shares that bring people back to the content. Well, we were working on a campaign where we saw that the shares were just not working. Like, hundreds of shares on Facebook, like five people came back and read the article. So out of all of their friends, five people came back and read the article. We reviewed the share headline and image and just saw that the image was real stock photo. Like, it just didn't work. They changed the image. They increased their earned impressions by, like, 25%. And that was through no massive content change. That was just changing an image. So those things, and like changing headlines, for the most part, can be fairly pain-free. There are some other things you might want to look at, like, OK, I can see that people are scrolling 54% of the content, and we've put the video that we want people to watch at 70% of the way down the content. Well, I might want to be moving that video further up. Well, I definitely want to be moving that video further up. I want to make sure that it's in eyesight, you know, before people leave the content. So. After that, you probably get down to your kind of more bigger rewrites, but depending on the length of duration of the campaign and investment, you might not decide to do it. But those are the kind of content edits you can do that can really make a difference. And I will hand over to Lauren, who has got a really great example of almost all of those things being done <laughs> at once. Yeah, Holly, this one um, definitely is an example of all that you just mentioned. <laughs> um, it's not always like this. Um, sometimes it is just the minor adjustments in a campaign. Um, but we, in the entertainment industry, anyone who's familiar with award season knows that there's a phase one and a phase two. Phase one being that um, it is marketing for the film um, to be nominated for an award. Um, and then phase two being focused on the voters and making sure that the film is voted for so that it can potentially win one of the awards. Um, and so this campaign with Amazon, it was actually to promote two of their films. So one being Manchester by the Sea and the other one being Gleason. Um, and so we started in phase one with both films. Um, and once phase one ended, we realized that the nominations were skewed um, in favor of Manchester by the Sea. So Gleason received 19 nominations and Manchester by the Sea received 226. <laughs> um, and so not only did we make the decision, it was also a decision by Amazon to focus their marketing efforts on Manchester by the Sea. So this really did require a lot of adjustment 
um, and optimizing on the fly um, to go from phase one to phase two. So not only did we change our content, we went back to some of the talent from Manchester by the Sea and did some additional interviews. Um, we also adjusted the marketing creative to remove any mention of Gleason. Um, we reallocated our social budgets and banner impressions and targeting um, so that it was mostly focused on an audience um, for Manchester. So really, it, it was one of those examples where we had to do a full rehaul um, in how we approached the campaign. But um, in the end, um, it did receive a successful result with two Oscar wins. So I, it must have worked somehow. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's the extreme example there. I think that's such a great, you know, such a great KPI. Oscar. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> One. Um, of course, you know, as much as I love this example because it's sort of like, you know, everything that you could possibly do, change content, produce more content, do different distribution, change approach, direction, strategy, like everything <laughs> was optimized on the fly, which is obviously amazing. Um, but, you know, don't be overly concerned where you're like, wow, that's, you know, such a massive part. Maybe we're not going to do all of those things. There are so many examples. And I think, Lauren, you were talking, you know, maybe you mentioned earlier to me before about how, you know, even on just your regular campaigns, there's always some optimizing, right? Definitely. Yeah. I think you just, it's like budget's going to be moved, you know, distribution might not be working. You might want to change something. Maybe one piece of content's performing best. You need to move budget around. But just think about it and just remember that the, the campaign launch date isn't the end date. It's the, okay, now we can actually allow, you know, data um, to kind of make those decisions for us. So, as a bit of a summary before we get into a Q&A session, um, we have talked about uh, setting KPIs, so really building out from your objectives, selecting the right metrics, using benchmarks, and the example of that was like variety, you know, looking at voter reach, consumer reach, and ensuring that you reach the right audience to persuade and establishing the right metrics for that. We've also discussed the top content formats for entertainment, and we're deriving this from the top KPIs, you know, for entertainment, Video is vital, but don't be afraid to put some text around that. A lot of people, sometimes some people are going to want to read it, some people are going to want to view it, but together it's actually a really good combination of getting more people to take that post-purchase, uh, that post kind of, you know, after reading it, what are they going to do? And then a really massive one is how to select distribution platforms. You know, your campaigns can't exist without it. I know we've banged on about it a lot, <laughs> but it, it's important. And you've got to think about what's the preferred content medium the target audience, what are the performance goals going to be, and then look at those post-click metrics and make sure to optimize. So it's about working backwards from the objective and how you get to that goal. And finally, some really practical tips about optimizing on the fly. Again, I think you can tell that that's another big one for us. You know, embrace it. It's going to happen. You know, it's it's going to happen in almost even the even people we know that have been doing these campaigns for such a long time, even the publishers optimize. Everybody optimizes. And that's a great thing. It means they're actually looking at the results and making decisions based off that. So really embrace it. Look at quality distribution, balancing things between different devices. You also want to um, look at adjusting the spend, the right piece of content, and when necessary, making light edits. Now, Lauren obviously gave that great example of taking market feedback, changing market conditions to force changes. And that works as a really great example of what can be done when needs to be done, <laughs> adjusting the focus to the most important piece of content, and then elevating what was working. So a really nice example of how phase one to phase two shift can really change up. And then, of course, they won an Oscar. So great, great KPI outcome there. <laughs> um, so as you can tell, it's obviously important to optimize. Now, just quickly, here's, um, here's a little bit about how Nudge can help. Nudge is a native content analytics platform, and we're really here to help you execute your native campaigns seamlessly. We provide you these tools for running your content campaigns, looking at everything to those rich behavioral metrics, looking at benchmarks to actually help you, you know, set those KPIs, insights, attribution, looking at the distribution, and really providing you with all the things to just make that campaign seamless and effective. Yeah, and here at Variety, we have our own in-house content studio. So we are really helpful throughout the entire process, um, if it be ideating, um, programming talent, um, producing the content, distribu 
just distributing the content <laughs> and optimizing that content and reporting on it. So really we do it all in-house, which is um, a, a great asset we have. Um, we also have access to entertainment's most prominent power players and talent. So this is actually really helpful for a lot of our content. Um, we can reach out to certain talent, um, executives to be part of our content, and we do have um, a leg up in that access. Um, we do have an engaged and affluent and influential audience um, for to view our content, and we also are a 112-year-old brand with an established and trusted industry voice, which is very important in native content um, to make sure that the readers are really, really looking at the content as valuable information. Awesome. And so now this is your chance to um, answer any questions. We've both worked across thousands of campaigns. Um, any questions to what we discussed or anything about the entertainment category? And I think Gustav um, has been keeping an eye on the questions. Did anything come through? Hi, guys. Yes, I have. Um, yeah, we received one question, and it's for Lauren. Um, how can agencies and brands work most effectively with your team to get the best work, seeing as content isn't as straightforward as just setting some media? Yeah, definitely. Um, great question. And I think from a publication perspective, um, it's very important for the agency um, and their client to be in direct communication and constant communication because when there are three parties involved, um, it's just very important to have an objective be clear. Um, and yes, we will optimize on the fly and can make changes as we go. Um, but it is good to start with a clear idea of, of what kind of KPIs you're looking for, um, how you want the content to be perceived, and what kind of audience you're trying to reach. So really just upfront, clear communication, um, and just being willing to um, make changes throughout the campaign. I think that's Holly touched on that really well um, in this presentation is just understanding that when the campaign starts doesn't mean that that's the end of it. You have to be willing to make changes and to communicate um, with the publisher as well as the client and agency. Everyone needs to be communicating even post launch. Yeah, I think that's. I think you're so right there, Lauren. I think that's. I think it's kind of what we've discussed, right, as we've gone through this, but like all of those things that we've discussed today are really going to help these be more effective entertainment campaigns, but I think Lauren's so right. Once it comes to content, everyone's just got to realize they've got to be, there's got to almost be more communication, right? <laughs> there's got to be really clear briefing about what the client's looking for, Maybe it's a call, everyone gets together, hashes some ideas out. And then also something we found that works really well, Lauren, I'm not sure if you found this as well, but just once the campaign's gone live, having like, you know, like after 48 hours, a call set up just to talk through anything, and then maybe like every two weeks or three weeks, depending on the length of the campaign, just a little check-in for everybody that's kind of set as a, you know, as a calendar event before, um, so that Definitely. everyone's kind of got that time to, to connect because, it's different to banners. There's, it's content. You know, there's going to be things that happen. Maybe optimizations need to be made. And as long as everyone comes together, um, that can work really well. Definitely. Uh, I've also just gotten another question, uh, and it's for you, Holly. Um, yes. <laughs> working with the Nudge team, um, well, working with the Nudge uh, platform as an advertiser, uh, can you choose what publishers my content is distributed to? Ah, so great question. That's not actually where Nudge comes into play. So, for example, the way Nudge comes in is when you're looking to work with publishers like Variety or um, you know campaigns that we measure across New York Times or Wall Street Journal. We provide you that measurement across all those different campaigns. So, a good example would be a campaign that we're running at the moment for a brand that's across New York Times, Condé Nast Traveler, Huffington Post, Mike. Nudge gives everybody a dashboard to log into and view how those content campaigns are performing, looking at the same metrics across all of them and the benchmarks and everything else. And there are native networks that you can go through that will kind of push your content out onto publisher sites, but we work more directly with the agency and the you know kind of chosen publishers. Um, but um, I'll make sure I get the contact details for who asked the question so I can and send through some helpful tips for that one. Mm -hmm. um... And that's it. Uh, we actually had a couple of people also asking if they can watch the recording afterwards, and uh, the answer is yes, we do <laughs> upload 
previous web, uh, previous webinars to the website, and we have a resource section there, so just head over there and, and, and have a look. Yeah, and actually on that, you know, thank you everyone for attending. We're actually going to put all of the slides that we went through today up on our um, up on the Nudge blog afterwards, and we'll actually email everyone with a link uh, tomorrow. So don't worry, we'll get that across to you. And then once the videos um, you know, been uh, been sorted out, we'll make sure that we get that out and we'll follow up as well so that you can actually watch it um, online. Feel free to share with your colleagues. Um, also, please, you know, give us both a Twitter, uh, give it a nudge and variety. And any follow-up questions, reach out to your nudge or variety account manager and we're here to help. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye.